have the, uh, the dubious honor of being the person between you and lunch. So I'm going to try and get, uh, stay punchy and I'm going to try and uh, give you as much specific material as possible for someone, for people who are putting together uh, um, uh, the, new, uh, the new program that you're, you're looking at. So first of all, uh, what do I consider to be emerging arts? Well, I actually like some of the speakers earlier that said that actually emerging arts have been going on forever, ever since um, Lumiere Brothers added a sprocket to the kinetoscope and turned it into cinemagraph, that was emerging arts. So it's been going on all this time. So what I want to do here is to share with you some specific ideas that, the, uh, that you might want to, uh, to add into your curriculum. So um, the first thing I want to share with you is I'm uh, chairman of the VR advisory group for BAFTA. And this group's pretty interesting because it's made up half between creators and half between technology. And there recently was a furious debate, which seemed to me at the beginning, esoteric, not really that important. And the debate was, is VR a platform or is it an art form? And the debate was interesting because it turned out that we agreed unanimously, actually, that it was both. And that was interesting because the games console is certainly not an art form. The games are an art form. The console is not. And yet, for virtual realities and immersive technologies, the marriage between the technology and the art has to be very carefully entwined. And the reason for that is because the storytellers and the directors and the producers can't produce and tell all the stories that they want without the technology supporting it. They are closely matched. And so I thought that was, uh, that was important and it has a direct bearing on an emerging uh, media conference. So a little quickly, a little bit, I'm not going to talk about me because of, the time, because of time and that's not my style, but a little bit about AMD. We make chips. We make microchips, we make processors, and our processors are in the uh, uh, PlayStation, and they're, gonna, and they're in Xbox, and they're in the current PlayStation that runs VR, and they're going to be in the next uh, Xbox which runs VR. In fact, last year, 83% of all virtual reality uh, ran on AMD-based products. So uh, that's a little bit about the background, uh, why I feel like we should be able to talk about this. Um, but it occurs to me, and I'm told that very often, I make, take for granted, I assume that you know the things that, that we know. I actually like that comment earlier from Jeff about it shouldn't be on the inside, you've got to get it on the outside. So the chips that we make um, relative to emerging media are used in, uh, in three major ways. The first way is that in the content creation process, if you're doing uh, pre-visualization or post-production, or even virtual production using a workstation, uh, like this one here from HP. And we make the processors that go inside of those boxes, both the, uh, the, the central processor unit, the CPU, and the GPU. Um, the second thing we're doing is we're inventing. We're coming up with new ideas uh, on how to uh, create emerging media. Um, two years ago, we invented something called Liquid VR. Um, you will recall that it wasn't so long ago. It was impossible to talk about virtual reality without mentioning motion sickness. And so uh, we had a brilliant young engineer called Leila Ma who came up with something called Last Latch, an asynchronous compute, and we put that in something called Liquid VR, which was immediately adopted by uh, Valve and by Oculus. And today we don't talk about motion sickness, although it hasn't completely gone away. And then the last thing we do is we power the computers that actually experience technology. And here's an interesting observation. For the last 122 years, technology has been used to create the content it hasn't been used to consume the content. The consumption of content has involved a rather comfortable chair, or sometimes not so comfortable, and a large screen or a screen in the living room. And yet now for emerging technologies, actually you need technology to consume as well as to create. So why do I believe that immersive technologies and VR are so important to the storytelling process and to the film industry? I believe that the, that is the case because in its best um, at its best, a wonderful piece of movie or television takes us away from ourselves. That for the period of the, one, the hour or the two hours that we're watching that, we are not in our living room, we are not in a cinema, we are totally taken outside of ourselves and away. And that, I believe, is why it's so universally popular, regardless of age or culture or, or background or anything else. So I was very interested to reach about some, uh, this piece of research, which was done by, um, I think by Virginia Tech, and what they did was they wanted to measure that immersion. So here's my first kind of request. It was you're thinking about the curriculum. I'd love to learn more about this. And here's what they did. They took two sets of students and they, uh, and they put them into this room. Now, one set of students were looking through a traditional monitor and the other set of students were in virtual reality. And then what they did was they asked them to identify <coughs> patterns, sequences. 
and the set in virtual reality were dramatically faster than the ones who were looked for a traditional monitor. In fact, not only that, but hours and days and weeks afterwards, their cognitive recall was also better, and, uh, and the cognitive performance continued to be better. So we know then that virtual reality does this. I'd love to learn about some more research. That's a little bit of science. Now I want to show you an interesting video, and can we make sure we have the, uh, the audio? We've all seen scary movies, and we've seen some scary television, and we sometimes jumped. But I want you to, uh, to look at the reaction to the virtual reality experience for paranormal activity. So let's just roll this video. This is put together by my friends at VR Works. They put this on location at AMC theaters across America to coincide with the film. Now here's the interesting thing, I know I'm being filmed, I am determined that I'm not going to jump because I'm going to be filmed and, it's going, and, I'm, and I know you're going to see it. And yet still, the sense of immersion was so strong that I still couldn't stop myself and that's what I think is exciting about this medium. But I don't believe yet that we really understand the medium very well. And one of the reasons for that is we always look at new technology through the prism of the old one. And that's why I believe the first movies look like theatre plays and the first VR looks like movies because that's what we understand. And so I want to make this share this observation with you. We have in virtual reality the ability to completely reimagine what I call the Z or depth. So we know that we have in this medium the ability to zoom far, far out or zoom, zoom far uh, close in. And yet I don't believe we're taking advantage of that or even beginning to understand it properly because, quite frankly, how could we? We can only see it amongst the prism of the one that we know. So let me show you a couple of examples here. Um, this is HoloLens from Microsoft uh, using augmented reality to re-understand about the, how, the way the blood system flows. And I thought this is really interesting, but yet they're not going far enough. Because actually you can use this medium to go down to subatomic level to re-understand the way our DNA strands work. And I think we're going to be able to understand the body in completely new ways we ever thought of before. Let me give you one other example. It's a popular piece of augmented reality from Epson, which can allow uh, relatively modestly trained engineers to do some sophisticated work using augmented reality. And yet, why couldn't they actually design or build a Swiss watch? Because we don't think in these terms. How could we? And I think that one of the things that I, one of the things I know that I love about students, so Megan asked me what I, what's most important in that VR, it's the students, because they don't, they're not inhibited, they're not held back by the constraints of thinking that we had. And as they use the medium more, they're going to find new ways uh, to explore in it. Now, the only thing I want to do um, is to share another observation for you, something else I'd like you to consider for your, your curriculum. The human visual system is very, very clever. And it's much cleverer than any system we've designed for a camera. And the reason for that is, quite frankly, our very survival depending on it. Um, if you can't quickly identify that there's a tiger running towards you in, a, within, in, a, in your environment, you might actually be caught by the tiger and die. So, a human visual system designed like that, we can take in a huge amount of data that no camera can replicate. Yet in virtual reality, we can. We can replicate those environments. This is a scene from uh, uh, Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones. And it's an enorm enormously complex scene to film. In fact, the scene cost uh, uh, more than $10 million. And in, the reason for that is the director has to simultaneously do uh, some different things. First of all, he has to continue to keep us connected to the characters that we care about in the scene. <laughs> At the same time, he has to show you that they're all about to be killed because they're surrounded. And then he also needs to be able to pan out and show you that you're about to be rescued. Very, very complex, a large number of camera angles. In virtual reality, we would be able to take that all in in a very, very natural way. So I think when we're teaching about emerging technologies and immersive technologies um, in, um, uh, with the students, 
understanding the human visual system and the opportunities of virtual reality gives you is very important. And I, I do work with, uh, with Dodge Chapman and uh, NFTS, and I am very encouraged by the students who are completely unafraid of not having control of the camera to drive direction. And I think that's really fantastic. The other opportunity, and, and this came up at dinner last night, is audio. I'll be, I'll be a little bit controversial to people that work in audio, and I apologize in advance. I don't think we're well served by audio in entertainment. And the reason for that, it's not their fault, it's because uh, the people with the money, you know, the people we don't like who control films, they have to uh, con constrain the budget based on how the experience is going to be enjoyed. And they have no control over whether the film is being watched in a two-buck chuck, 20-seat cinema or in an IMAX. And at home, quite frankly, most television audio systems are not very good. The speakers aren't that great. So why would you invest in really, really great audio? And so for that reason, we don't get whispering, we don't get lots of ambient sound, we get very big environmental effects, but we don't get uh, uh, very much occlusion. In, in virtual reality and immersive technologies, we know exactly where the speakers are, they're right on your head. And so we'll be able to do some really, really cool things. Um, one of the questions I was asked, what are the areas that AMD would invest in? Well, one of the areas we would invest in is any students or any body of work which makes more better use of audio in immersive technologies. Now, this is a busy, complex slide, but it contains some really important points. Good, don't worry, I have a tight time, I'm not going to go for it all. But I want to share with you something that I discovered recently, which is really, really a big deal, and that is um, virtual reality is having an impact, an unintended impact, of changing the post-production, pre-production, and digital pipeline of the film industry. And this industry is worth billions and billions of dollars. And what I have seen is, it wasn't intentional. So let me explain for a second. The first virtual reality which started out, and by the way, Hollywood makes much more VR than the games industry so far. Uh, none of the big games published like Electronic Arts um, have produced any AAA titles. And yet Hollywood has produced over 300 pieces of VR connected narrative, mainly as promotional pieces, what's sometimes unkindly called PR for VR. Um, but they produce the most. Now here's, here's the interesting thing that's happened. I started out doing 360. 360 VR is great and its time is going to come back right now, but right now I see it dying on the vine. And the reason it's dying on the vine is because you can look around and that's great, but you can't interact. And when you've been able to interact, you don't like being held down like this. You want to interact. So, the movie industry then says, we want, we want to use game engines. Then something interesting starts happening. They start using game engines and then they realize the quality of this stuff's pretty damn good. It's not yet, it's not yet at a quality that the James Cameron is going to immediately start using the game. It's not. But it's getting close. And it's close enough that you can see that by the time your students graduate, we will start to see film made using real-time renderers. And that's huge. That's really huge. If you're Weta, okay, if you're a frame store, if you're Deluxe or Technicolor, that's huge. It's going to have profound effects because it's going to make film cheaper and faster to make and have special effects, but there are some challenges, and that brings me on to something else I wanted to share with you all today. I was so excited about it, come along. We started out with doing post-production around kind of 1990, and that's a very well-established industry. Then around 1996, we started to use game engines to do pre-visualization. You could save money and time on set by brief buttons, you know all this. Then we moved into virtual production, so that's a digital pipeline. Okay, so so far, so good. However, how do we get actors and actresses and beautiful assets into that pipeline. And so I'm very, very excited about volumetric capture and in particular light field capture. And I think these are gonna be explosive areas. The other thing is, if we're gonna build virtual reality worlds, unless and until we work out how to build them with millions of people in them, extraordinarily hard. Right now, if you go and play Call of Duty or a Battlefield game, it's about 120 players. That's all, we, that's all we can get on a server together at one time. But if we're going to create real worlds, we need hundreds of millions of people, billions of entities. So we're going to need AI. So let's I want to show you a couple of these couple of areas, which I think could be really terrific areas for, to explore for the school. So the first thing is light field. So Mr. Paul Dubevic is a wonderful, wonderful man at USC and now works at Google. Um, he has done some great, great work on light fields. Um, and what a light field is, is literally this cage, as you can see, uh, covered inside with LEDs, and you take an actor or an actress and you capture them. Now, every, all of that is offline today. Uh, they're captured completely lifelike, 
Perfectly great for film, for offline renderers, but not yet anywhere where we could do it in a real-time rendered environment, but we're going to get there. And actors and actresses were being captured now. Obama was captured. Um, at some point, we're going to, be able to take those assets and we're going to be able to render them in real time and animate them. Tons of work to do here. Massive computational advances needed. But the competition between ourselves and our two competitors, Intel and NVIDIA, boy, we really hate each other. We're going to, we are going to compete so, so hard and fast that we're going to get here much, much faster than you think. So I'm very excited for any research into, into light fields. Now, I want to show you this. This is um, a piece of content made by Remington Scott. Um, Remington did all of the animation uh, for Gollum in Lord of the Rings. And, uh, and McInnes, John McInnes, he wrote uh, the script for Call of Duty. They used volumetric capture for this. Uh, v this is a VR piece of content. And what I want to draw your attention to is the quality of the animation, because this is in the game engine. This is in Unreal Engine 4. And I, you can't see it so well here. It's only 720p. But the quality of the animation and of the piece in a game engine, I think, is really, really terrific. I'd love to see more work done here, too. But now let me um, talk about something else. Uh, I'm going to refer to scripts, but the scripts I talk about aren't the same scripts that you talk about. Um, when I refer to a script, it's a piece of code. It's, it's hundreds of lines of code. In fact, actually often millions of times of code. Now here's something interesting as well. Started out for, the, um, uh, for, the, for game engines and virtual reality, but I think it's going to have a massive, massive impact, and it's this. If you want a character to move in a game, you have Sometimes hundreds, millions of lines of command code, and that's what I call a script, which says you know, the character model has to move like this, and then move like this. And, and oftentimes, those characters don't look very realistic, because it's very, very difficult to make these kind of scripts, these command lines, and make them look really, really good. But what's happening now is deep neural networks and, uh, are being used to create uh, AI animated movement that's not only very, very natural, but think about this. Right now, uh, if you're DreamWorks and you're making How to Train Your Dragon, there's an enormous amount of work which goes into character movement, making it look realistic so that we can enjoy the character and we don't think, oh, it looks... That's been going on ever since Disney uh, came up with Bambi. It's very expensive. Now, how about now if the director can simply say to Kung Fu Panda, they can talk to him and just say, walk up the stairs or climb that rope. With AI, this will happen. We will direct characters and we will speak, the director will speak to them as though they are a natural human being. Again, a ton of work, tons of computation to go in here, but um, artificial intelligence holds huge promise for the making of film and television in the future. And it's another really, really great area. Um, now let's talk about some of that, uh, that difficulty, and, I, and I get, I'm going to keep speeding up. This is the opening scene um, from Gladiator. I'm sure everybody has seen it. Um, and this scene is particularly interesting to me because, first of all, it's very, very exciting. Thousands of Romans, thousands of Goths um, in a in forest, so lots and lots and lots of trees. And then as the battle starts, they fire those arrows, and then they fire the fireballs and so on. Now here's the interesting thing today. This could not be made in VR today. Utterly, utterly impossible. Um, we have what I call the, the rock, paper, scissors. And this is where I'm going to circle back to the beginning and give you the complete kind of touch points in all of my, my, my speech to you today. Um, if you wanted to make that, you just couldn't. And so what would happen is um, the producer director is going to sit down and go, ah, can't have the fireballs. Or you can, you can do it, but you can't have the trees. So you can have high quality visuals, lower frame rates, Less entities, or more entities, but it's rock, paper, scissors. You can't have all of those things. That's today. Now, if you're making a piece of content that's planning to come out in three to five years, you can't um, do that within the parameters of current constraints because things are going to evolve so quickly. And, and so my final point uh, on that theme and my conclusion, I've gone as fast as I could for you, um, is this. It is entirely likely that the most important technological innovations to take place in the next 30 years have not only not yet been invented, they haven't even been thought of. And one of the things, even though I'm in my 50s now, that keeps me as animated as you can see and as excited as I am, is 
the fact that if we think for a second that all the great, brilliant ideas have happened, they most certainly have not. There is another Google, another Facebook, another Twitter. There is everything to be invented. And the reason I gave up my weekend to come and be with you all, first of all, it's a great honor, thank you for inviting me, is because you hold the key. Your students are going to invent the techniques and the products and the things that are going to make all this come true. That's exciting. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>